response for Robert Mueller couldn't and wouldn't be necessary. It's a Democrat hoax that was brought up as an excuse for losing an election that, frankly, the Democrats should have won because they have such a tremendous advantage in the Electoral College. So it was brought up for that reason. But it has been determined that there is no collusion. Chief White House Correspondent John Roberts, who asked the question that elicited that response, is live with more on the story. John. John, good morning to you. President Trump appears to be moving the goalposts a little bit here in terms of whether or not he will sit down for an interview with the special counsel Robert Mueller. The president's legal team, sources tell Fox News, fully expects that Mueller will ask for an interview sometime between now and wrapping up the investigation, which they believe will be in the next few weeks. When the president was first asked about this in June of 2016, he said, yes, he'd sit down. Absolutely, 100 percent. He was asked about it again at Camp David over the weekend, in which he said, yeah, but reminded people that he believes there was no collusion, no crime committed. But when I posited the question to him yesterday, he went in a different direction. Listen here. It has been determined that there is no collusion and by virtually everybody. So we'll see what happens. Would you, would you be open to it? We'll see what happens. I mean, certainly I'll see what happens. But uh, when they have no collusion and nobody's found any collusion at any level, uh, it seems unlikely that you'd even have an interview. So the president now saying he doesn't see any reason why there would be an interview anyways. I uh, spoke with sources who are close to the legal investigation. They say that despite what the president said yesterday, preparations are being made for an interview with Robert Mueller. They're just looking at setting the ground rules, what Mueller would be able to talk about and not talk about. Still not to say that an interview will happen for sure, but they do believe it's more likely than not. At the same time as all of this is going on, the president blindsided Republicans in Congress and his own staff, you know, they're taking up this FISA bill, Section 702. You saw Paul Ryan talking about that just before the top of the hour. Well, this morning, the president got up and tweeted out something very critical of the FISA law, where he tweeted, quote, House votes on controversial FISA act today. This is an act that may have been used with the help of the discredited and phony dossier to so badly surveil and abuse the Trump campaign by the previous administration and others. You know, the president's staff, led by Homeland Security Advisor Tom Bossert, has been selling for weeks now the importance of renewing this FISA, or what's called 702 authority, pushing it as a critical tool in rooting out people who would do harm to our nation overseas. But the reaction was immediate. Adam Schiff, who's the ranking member of the House Intelligence Committee, leapt to the floor to say, well, well, because of what the president said, maybe we should put this whole discussion on hold. Listen here. In, in light of the uh, irresponsible and inherently contradictory messages coming out of the White House today, I would recommend that we withdraw consideration of the bill today uh, to give us more time to address the privacy questions that have been raised, uh, as well as to get a clear statement from the administration about their position on the bill. Well, somebody clearly got in the president's ear because about two hours after he fired out the initial tweet, there was a cleanup on aisle 702, if you will. The president tweeting, quote, with that being said, I have personally directed the fix to the unmasking process since taking office. And today's vote is about foreign surveillance of foreign bad guys on foreign land. We need it. Get smart. The president there, uh, John, referring to a directive he sent out yesterday to Dan Coates, the director of national intelligence, to develop a policy when it comes to requests to unmask the names of Americans who are caught up in foreign surveillance. Of course, uh, that's what we were talking about in terms of the unmasking of Trump administration, or at least campaign officials uh, after the election. So the, the president clearly concerned about that. But I'll tell you, a lot of people around here scratching their heads as to what he was talking about this morning, John. Yeah, it's uh, always an interesting uh, day there at that building behind you. <laughs> Say the least. John Roberts, our chief White House correspondent. Thank you. Thanks. Let's get a little more on the cleanup on aisle 702 now. The president's comments about the Russia investigation. Let's bring in Ari Fleischer, former White House press secretary to President George W. Bush and a Fox News contributor. Uh, so let's start with the, the latest tweets first from the president. He, he is suggesting that, uh, you know, the FISA Act may have been in, uh, invoked or may have been used in spying on his campaign, but then he seemed to back away from it. What is he doing to this very complicated vote that's in the House right now? Uh, yeah, it looks like it's a good day to take him seriously, but not literally. <laughs> I mean, if you're a lawmaker and you have to vote on the specific provisions of this FISA legislation pending, the president threw a curveball at you. Um, not helpful in the legislative process. 
But the broader point the president is making about FISA and about collusion, and obviously is hot on his mind, uh, the president has merit when he talks about why the FBI inve investigating this to, in the beginning and the unmasking that took place, I think, still does remain objectionable. Not a legislative issue, a personal issue. He also tweeted, well, let's go way back to yesterday morning when he put out this tweet. He said, the single greatest witch hunt in American history continues. There was no collusion. Everybody, including the Dems, knows there was no collusion. And yet on and on it goes. Russia and the world is laughing at the stupidity they are witnessing. Republicans should finally take control. That also left some people scratching their heads on Capitol Hill. Republicans should take control of what? Well, let me make two points. One, the middle part of that tweet. When the president says that Russia is laughing, the world is laughing, there's a lot of merit to that. I think this investigation has tied the president and the executive branch's hands as far as how they want to deal with Russia. It stopped them from doing things that, in the normal course of foreign policy, the president should be free to do when it comes to what he wants to be involved with in Russia or not, as far as America's diplomatic and, and other activities around the world. It's frozen it. Uh, as for the Republicans taking control, yeah, that part I'm not sure about myself. Again, I think that's more take it seriously, not literally. I think what the president means is Republicans should have his back. There was no collusion. But the Congress has its own obligation to do an investigation. Frankly, I think when all these investigations are done, based on everything known to date, there won't be any collusion found. The president wants to get to that day fast. Congress and Mueller, I hope, get there as well rather quickly. The, the president helped get the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act passed. The economy has been on a tear. Uh, the stock market has certainly been on a tear. Would he, I mean, if you were advising him in the White House, would he be better to leave the Russia investigation alone? Because it seems like every time he tweets about it, it just causes his political enemies to, to go into a frazzle. Well, on the one hand, I think the president is doing a good job of making clear there is no collusion, and, and I think people inclined to agree with that. Um, the bigger issue, though, is if you're a Republican running for re-election in 2018, you want to be known for the laws you've passed, the people you've helped, the things you've accomplished, the growth in the economy, the bonuses people are getting, the raise in wages. That's what you want to be known for, <coughs> policies, laws. The president wants to be known for himself. He wants to, the elections to be about him, his personality, his style, how he's changing Washington. But he's not on the ballot in 2018. So I think the more Republicans and the president can focus on laws, policies, and the good things in the economy, the less on individual personalities, including the president's, the stronger Republicans will be in 2018. And we will see what comes of the president's assertion that there is no collusion because um, multiple investigations are still underway. Ari Fleischer. Ari, thank you. So just weeks after the state's largest wildfire, deadly mudslide slam into a Southern California community, killing 17 people. How survivors describe the devastation left behind. people killed. Eight others remain missing at this hour after devastating mudslides slammed into one of the wealthiest communities in Southern California. 65 homes in Montecito were destroyed and more than 400 damaged after these flash floods literally ripped through hillsides, stripping bare of vegetation by last month's Thomas wildfire. Uh, thousands have been forced out of their homes as rescue crews now race to find any remaining survivors. It's apocalyptic. I had no idea that the, that the devastation was like this. It sounded like a hurricane or a freight train coming through. I mean, this is just, I can't quite, can't quite believe it. So far, rescue crews have covered about 75% of the inundated area. Any solution has to include the wall because without the wall, it all doesn't work. Uh, you can look at other instances, look at what happened in Israel. They put up the wall, they say it solved a very major problem. We need the wall. We have to have the wall for security purposes. Security is number one. And uh, so the answer is have to have the wall. President Trump sending a very clear message yesterday when asked if he would agree to a deal on DACA with Democrats, a deal that he says must include funding for a wall along our southern border. 
Joining us now, Arizona Congresswoman Martha McSally, vitally involved in this issue. She serves on the Homeland Security and Armed Services Committees. So the president has said there are four things that are essential to any deal on, on uh, immigration. He says you got to have more money for border security. You got to end chain migration. You got to end the visa lottery. And then you have to come up with some kind of an arrangement on DACA or the so-called DREAMers. Uh, sounds pretty reasonable. Yes. Are, are you inclined to go along with what the president has to say? And, and what about uh, some in the opposing party? Absolutely. Uh, we've been working on this now for months, and four of us, members of Congress in the House, introduced a bill yesterday that essentially covers the president's priorities. Look, I think Republicans are generally open to some sort of legislative move related to the DACA population, but there's a couple of priorities that have to be most important. One is we have to secure our border. I represent a border district. We have cartels trafficking through our communities. It's a public safety and national security issue, and we need to make sure we're not incentivized more illegal activity coming across the border. So that's a reasonable request to include a border wall, and we've seen how barriers work in a district like mine. Additionally, we've got to make sure we've got agents and technology and a strategy that's going to work. Uh, also in our bill, we've got ending chain migration, ending the visa lottery, cracking down on sanctuary cities and Kate's law, and we've got a mandatory E-Verify and a guest worker program. These are very reasonable things that uh, are, are really we're asking to tie together with any DACA solution, and we're asking for a Democrat colleagues to uh, get more reasonable and start negotiating with us in good faith. But some Democrats have said, you know, it's DACA and nothing else. No strings attached. You got to pass DACA. You got to find a way to allow the dreamers to stay in this country. What do you say? It's not happening. First of all, they are trying to hold our budget negotiations hostage to this issue. And it's our military that is suffering the most. January 19th is when the government funding ends. And our military needs certainty and funding in the readiness crisis that we're in so that they can keep us safe. And I think it's unbelievable. I brought it up at the White House meeting that they are now trying to hold our military hostage so they can protect people that are here illegally. It doesn't make any sense, and the American people aren't going to go for it. The deadline is March 5th. Let's support our military fund the government and continue to negotiate in good faith. They have got to come off their unreasonable view that is DACA or nothing. It's not happening. We've got to secure a border. We've got to end Cheyenne migration, the visa lottery, and have these other fixes in place so that we make sure we're not in a situation with 800,000 more DACA people in the next one, two, five years. That is a reasonable approach that we have taken, and we're asking our counterparts to meet us there. But as you know, there are many in the Democrat Party. I mean, California just voted itself a sanctuary state. So uh, there are many who think that, you know, the notion of sanctuary state cities is, is sacrosanct. And it's irresponsible. Kate Steinle's family will be the first to tell you that. Uh, because of the man who killed her, who had been deported five times, and when the federal authorities were begging, please let them come into the jail and get him, he was released again into the community. This is irresponsible, and it is a public safety threat to communities around our country, and we shouldn't be playing politics with American lives like that. Are the folks in your district uh, support the idea of a wall or at least some kind of you know, more effective border uh, separation? <clears throat> Those who live along the border will tell you when there was nothing before, no physical barriers, it was a free-for-all. The cartels were just driving and coming across anywhere they could. Now we have some physical barriers, and it has created a challenge, but we need more. There's places where it's Norma defenses. You can step right over it. So a, a border wall in places where it's appropriate combined with Border Patrol agents at the border and a good strategy, intel-driven operations and technology so that we can intercept, track, and get these guys as they're coming over. So this is something those who live along the border are dealing with every single day and they're glad and I am too that we now have a partner in the administration the White House that is willing and able to secure our border once and for all as these negotiations go along we're going to be keeping a very close eye on them congresswoman Martha McSally Republican of Arizona thank you thanks a dramatic heist in the heart of Paris thieves stealing millions in jewels from the Ritz Hotel and police say some of them are still on the loose Hot ice. More than $5 million worth of jewelry stolen from the Ritz Hotel in Paris. French police still searching for at least two thieves. It happened Wednesday evening when authorities say three suspects entered the hotel through a side door. They were arrested, but two other accomplices took the merchandise and got away. Police say some of the items have been found. Several high-end jewelry stores in the area have been targeted in recent years.
So President Trump escalating his attacks on fake news and renewing his call for a federal libel law. It's an effort basically some critics call futile because it's largely regulated under state law, but a move the president says is important to help protect Americans. Listen. Our current libel laws are a sham and a disgrace and do not represent American values or American fairness. So we're going to take a strong look at that. Uh, we want fairness. Uh, you can't say things that are false, knowingly false, and uh, be able to smile as money pours into your bank account. I'm joined now by Media Buzz host Howard Kurtz. Thank you very much, Howie, uh, sure. for talking to us. You know, we know this law is obviously a very personal one to the president, but if not for his war with the media, do we know any other reasons why he's backing this? Well, the president has has sung this tune before. He often talks about strengthening libel laws when he is unhappy with his coverage. He is unhappy right now with the Wolf Book. That was the reference to money pouring into the bank account. But uh, he hasn't actually pushed any legislation, given everything that's on his plate. I don't see that happening anytime soon. Yeah, the, you know, most recently the president's lawyers sent a cease and desist letter, uh, letters, in fact, to the author Michael Wolf and his publisher uh, before releasing the book, and that only backfired and prompted the publisher to release the book early. How could these libel laws, is he hoping, prevent authors from writing tell-alls about not just the president, but anyone for that matter? Yeah, well, that book, uh, that letter was a mistake because it gave, uh, you know, zillions of dollars in free publicity to the book, and there is no yes. prior restraint under our legal system. But look, president said uh, that uh, nobody, meaning journalists, should be able to publish anything that is knowingly false. Well, that's already, I, I agree with that. That's already covered by current libel law. Even a public figure can file a libel suit if uh, it can be proven that somebody, a reporter, an author, uh, published something with reckless disregard for the truth and with malice. Uh, but as a practical matter, a president, uh, as a, the ultimate public figure, uh, can't be spending his time running around filing libel suits. Okay. So he wants to file libel suits. He wants to personally be able to file libel suits if somebody prints something knowingly wrong. There's where the fine line between libel and crossing the line of the First Amendment comes into play, doesn't it? Yeah, and you know, look, Donald Trump in the past as a businessman has often threatened to sue, and he has filed a couple of suits against journalists. He sued a New York Times reporter for saying uh, in a book that he was worth less than, than Donald Trump had claimed. He sued a Chicago Tribune critic, this is about 30 years ago, uh, uh, for saying that his proposed Trump Tower was an ugly monstrosity. But. I think what we're really seeing here, Julie, is this is kind of like a brushback pitch in baseball. Uh, president trying to send a strong message to those who write about him, cover, pontificate about him, uh, that he is going to push back hard against what he sees as unfair or untruthful criticism. And actually, he's got a much stronger tool than filing a libel suit, which tends to drag on in the courts for a long period of time. He's got the bully pulpit and he's got the Twitter pulpit uh, to push back against people like Steve Bannon, Michael Wolf, you name it. Yeah, I mean, and the president, you know, his private lawyers have threatened lawsuits, like you mentioned, to many people. I mean, the, the list is huge, and the, you know, several journalists are among them, but they've never actually followed through on them. And I'm wondering what the message is there from the president and his legal team, or by going ahead and pushing forward this libel law legislation in 2018, if he's hoping to then go back to those lawsuits, hoping that they would stick, knowing that they possibly wouldn't under the current law. Well, the problem with the libel law legislation is it would have to, in effect, overturn a landmark Supreme Court ruling about, as I mentioned, reckless disregard, public figure, and so forth. So I think that's unlikely. As far as actually filing, look, there would be a real disadvantage for the president or any politician uh, in actually following through and filing a libel suit, legally entitled to do it, of course, and that is you open yourself up to discovery. Then you have to give a deposition. People in the White House might have to give a deposition. Uh, and also, uh, rather than letting the original um, slander or libel or unfavorable or untruthful assessments kind of fade with the news cycle, uh, the suit would keep it alive for months and you end up shining a very bright spotlight on that which you're criticizing. So then where does it infringe upon the freedom of the press? Is that something that could be a concern here that would, uh, I guess, halt this from passing? 
Well, you know, freedom of the press enshrined in the First Amendment doesn't mean that journalists can do anything, but it does mean under Supreme Court rulings that they can't be restrained in advance from publishing something, even if it's untruthful. Now, the remedy for any, pub any citizen, including public figures, is then to go to court and file a libel suit. Again, uh, for a president, I think it's kind of impractical. Uh, so instead, what Donald Trump is doing is sending a very strong uh, message about unfair journalism, which, as you may have noticed, uh, he tends to do every couple of days, sometimes every couple of hours. <laughs> every couple of hours, I think, is more like it. All right, Howard Kurtz, great to see you as always. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. John. Well, the U.S. flexes its military muscle, what we just deployed to the Pacific, and the message it is sending to North Korea. Plus, a guy going out to walk his dog gets attacked by a bear. He shares his terrifying story next. I'm really just happy to be alive. It could have been a totally different story. Justin, new military moves in the North Korea crisis. The U.S. deploying three powerful B-2 stealth bombers to Guam, a strategically important base, as Kim Jong-un tests his long-range missiles. All this despite the fact tensions on the North Korean peninsula have cooled off after North and South Korea held their first talks in more than two years. We have certainly problems with North Korea, but a lot of good talks are going on right now. A lot of good energy. I see a lot of good energy. I like it very much what I'm seeing. I think that we will have uh, peace through strength. Our military will be stronger than it ever was in a very short period of time. And uh, that's my opinion. That's not the general's opinion, but I think my opinion counts more right now. Joining us now, Michael O'Hanlon, Director of Foreign Policy Research at the Brookings Institution. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael, I want to ask you, first of all, what intelligence the president there was referring to, uh, and what is he sourcing his opinion on when he says that his opinion counts more than uh, his general's opinions regarding where our military stands when it comes to North Korea? What is he saying? <laughs> Hi, Julie. Well, uh, that's a tough question to open with. Uh, I don't, of course, it's always hard to, to try to figure out where Donald Trump might be coming from with a comment like that. I think what he's trying to do is, is show a little bit of Reagan-like optimism about the strength of the United States. And, you know, obviously any politician's going to claim a lot of credit for what changes he or she has made. So Donald Trump's not unusual in that. He's been in office for 12 months. There have been some uh, modernizations and improvements in the U.S. military. I don't think they've been dramatic. And I think the military was pretty good when he got to the White House. So uh, maybe that's what he's referring to when, when he's claiming there have been dramatic changes and the generals maybe are saying there have been modest but important changes. Either way, uh, I don't think we have any major issues on the military front in terms of our capability towards North Korea right. and the three uh, B-2 bombers that you mentioned going to Guam. You know, to some extent, that's almost normal crisis signaling that we've done over the years in regard to North Korea. Right. Obviously, everything now is on a little bit of, you know, uh, thin ice, and people are uh, very nervous about every move. I think the United States is trying to remind everyone that just because these talks between the North and the South in Korea are a little bit hopeful, we're not going to let down our guard, and they should not let down their enforcement of sanctions. So I think it's a combination of just trying to remind people not to get hopes too high, and relatively normal signaling behavior right. by the United States in this kind of a situation. Okay, we're obviously watching it closely and talks have began. It's not the same, I mean, it's not the first time that this has happened, so obviously we can't let our guard down. But the U.S. Air Force, uh, with their hard line stance, I'm talk about, you know, the deployment of those three nuclear capable B-2 stealth bombers. And then in addition to that, 200 airmen to Guam, which is joining a number of B-1 conventional bombers already deployed there. Um, what message exactly does it send about those talks? Does this strengthen talks possibly between the North and the South? Well, I'm pre in the broad scheme of things, I'm prepared to wish uh, President Trump well that his overall posture towards Korea, even though at times it scares me a little, may actually have created a sense of greater focus among some of the interested parties, and they've therefore applied sanctions more tightly, and therefore North Korea is a little bit more prepared to talk. All that is possible. And so I think, you know, I wish the president well. I'm not going to get into a debate about how much credit he deserves, the, the, because the main point is we are not yet anywhere near the finish line of where we need to be.
in terms of those B-2 bombers, you can interpret in different ways. There are various kinds of attacks they can carry out, nuclear mm -hmm. or conventional, as part of a big bombing campaign or as part of a, a very targeted right. bombing campaign, maybe against North Korean nuclear or missile infrastructure. But usually when we put bombers on alert like this or move them around, we're not necessarily even trying to be too concrete or specific about the kind of threat or, or attack we okay. might be threatening. Uh, people can read that in if they want. We don't necessarily discourage them reading that right. in. Uh, but I think it's more just a general sense of reminding people about the need for vigilance. And let's not just forget also as I move on, um, the, you know, the, the Pacific island of Guam is under direct threat. Kim Jong-un has said he has the missile, the nuclear capability to hit Guam. So certainly uh, setting a strong uh, stance there uh, on behalf of our military is essential. Uh, I want to switch gears now to Iran because uh, President Trump is expected to keep sanctions relief for Iran, but he may be adding some penalties. Um, first of all, how do you think sanctions are working out? Well, I think that's the right policy because I think that the sanctions in regard to the nuclear program uh, and the lifting of those sanctions has been, you know, a necessary part of the nuclear deal. We all know the nuclear deal is very controversial and very partisan, uh, but as Secretary Mattis and others have testified, now that it's sort of done and the rest of the world is relaxing the sanctions on Iran, it doesn't make that much sense for us to reimpose sanctions from that deal and risk losing the benefits of the deal. So even most uh, Republican critics of the deal acknowledge there are some benefits. They just don't think the benefits were enough to justify all the lifting of sanctions. But the right. sanctions are now lifted. And right. even if we reimpose them unilaterally, the rest of the world is not going to. So I think President Trump is right to look for other kinds of mm -hmm. sanctions on issues like ballistic missile development, on issues like Iran's support for terrorism. Uh, to your question about how well they're working, unfortunately, those sanctions have not produced a change in Iranian behavior yet, which is probably as bad as it's ever been in well, those and areas. The whole point of uh, sanctions, is it not? So then the answer to the question is no, it's not working that well because they're, they're, they're their nuclear ambitions are not being curbed, and that is the whole point here. But the president is also expected to announce new sanctions linked to human rights issues, uh, which would obviously underscore right. uh, U.S. concerns about Iran's response to recent anti-government protests there. Could this possibly help the people of Iran? I think it's generally the right thing to do, even if, you know, you get, you, you, your question was, do sanctions only have any justification if they work in the right. sense of changing behavior immediately? And I'm not sure that's the only purpose of sanctions. I think sometimes they allow us to establish a moral high ground and also impose a cost so that a country like Iran has to think about what it's doing, you know, and I, I, I think on the nuclear front, they have not curbed their ambitions, I agree with you, but they have changed their behavior because the nuclear deal requires that, at least for the next eight to ten years or so. On other issues like support for terrorism, suppression of their own people, development mm -hmm. of ballistic missiles, the Iran nuclear deal does not require any change and they have not made any change. But I still favor sanctions and I think that President Trump is right to stand with the people of Iran, you know, especially sure. if we can do it with our allies and make a concerted international support for those kinds of human rights, even if there is no immediate change. Because we have to stand on the right side of this issue more in the first instance. Yep, I agree. Michael O'Hanlon, thank you very much. Great to see you as always. Thanks. Thank well, you, Julie. One man counting his blessings <laughs> after he lets his dog out of the house and ends up in a life or death struggle with a wild animal. Came outside and he was right there. Mm -hmm. And I tried to run and it wasn't fast enough. A Florida man survives a bear attack that ends with 41 stitches to his face. Wow, the attack leaving the man with a facial laceration that required four hours of surgery. It happened Tuesday night outside the man's home in Naples. He says he stepped outside after letting his dog out, and that's when the four-footed bear lunged at him. I felt like somebody punched you. I mean, I didn't feel the cuts or anything. And it wasn't until I got back inside, looked down on my hand and saw blood all over. I just tried to go like this to get back in and it just did one of these. And I kind of flew that way and got my stuff together and somehow got in the door. I can't believe I just got hit by a bear. Oh my God, authorities say this is the first ever bear attack in South Florida. They have set traps in the area to catch the bear. No luck yet though. Let's hope they catch him. 
A Fox News alert. It is one of the most contentious issues on Capitol Hill these days, but the House has voted to uh, reauthorize the controversial Section 702 FISA Act. Um, that's the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act that sprung up after the horrible attacks of 9-11. The law allows uh, the NSA and other uh, uh, foreign surveillance agencies to tap into the communications of Americans when they are communicating with foreigners overseas. It has been very controversial. The president himself tweeted out this morning uh, that, that he felt that he had been caught up in FISA surveillance. Then he seemed to back off from that and, and tweet his support for it. At any rate, on a vote of 256 to 164, the FISA 702 Act has been reauthorized in the U.S. Congress. Democratic leaders facing some pushback in their own party over negotiations for a bipartisan DACA deal. Some rank-and-file Democrats want the focus to remain on so-called dreamers and border security. They fear top members of the party will give up too much to conservatives if the scope of immigration talks expands. But Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer insists the fate of DACA recipients remains the priority. I was encouraged by what the president said at the White House today. The tone was very good, but the devil lies in the details. And we need the president to follow up on this meeting, which boded well. First work on DACA and those narrow issues then move on to the broader, more comprehensive immigration reform. That's a plan we agree with. Let's bring in our panel. Michael Starr Hopkins is a Democratic strategist, an attorney, and contributor for The Hill. Steve Cortez is a spokesman for the Hispanic 100, who served on President Trump's Hispanic Advisory Council. He is also a Fox News contributor. Michael, it, it sounds like uh, a little bit like Chuck Schumer wants to have his cake and eat it, too. He wants to pass something for the dreamers, but he doesn't want to do any other negotiating on any other issue. That's not how politics works, is it? Uh, no, I think what Chuck Schumer is attempting to do is exactly what the president said he wants to do. He wants to focus on DACA first, make sure that those 800,000 individuals uh, are protected and allowed to stay as they expected to be. Uh, and then we can focus on issues like the wall. I think the big issue here is if we're going to spend $18 billion on a wall that isn't necessary, uh, then we need to be able to also authorize programs like the child health care program. Well, you know, sticking with you for a minute, Michael, we just had Congresswoman Martha, Martha McSally on from Arizona. She says the wall is very necessary, and, you know, her district shows it. Well, uh, I'll take the president's words. Uh, today he tweeted that uh, immigration, illegal immigration, is at an all-time low. Those two things don't seem to correspond. All right. Uh, Steve, let's talk to you about, about uh, the idea of settling on the DACA uh, issue, the so-called dreamers, and then talking about the fence and some other issues. Good politics, right. good it idea? No, I, I think we need to do it all at once, John. And by the way, I, I really reject the term dreamers. I think that the left often tries to hijack the language. Uh, American citizens have dreams, too, so I'm not going to call them dreamers. Uh, however, I do want the DACA adults, and they're adults, too. The left always tries to call them kids. I do want the DACA adults protected. I think they're a different category of illegal immigrant. They didn't choose to come here. They were brought as children. Having said that, it's an absolute necessity that we get full control of our broken immigration system. We have to end chain migration, end the visa lock and absolutely build the wall. And by the way, the Democrats are being so disingenuous on the wall because they themselves voted for border walls. Uh, Chuck Schumer, for example, as recently as 2013, voted for hundreds of miles of barricades at the border. Back in 2006, a couple of senators named Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton voted for massive new border fencing. Uh, so they were for this before it became politi politically expedient for them to suddenly oppose securing our border. Michael, it is true that for these children, the, the, again, he's right they are adults now but the the, the so-called dreamers were brought here as children illegally somebody broke the law to bring them here right uh, that is true uh, but those children the, the people who were children at the time they didn't break the law no. and shouldn't have to suffer go back to a country which they don't know uh, where they don't have family where they don't have jobs they're in all in all sense of purpose they're Americans and so you know what I'll say to Steve's point uh, about the wall Democrats have voted to support uh, technical technological advances in the wall I support that but what I don't support is a wall that covers you know over 200,000 uh, miles of our border that's not how we should spend our money and Republicans for a long time have talked about fiscal responsibility so let's do that let's be 
fiscally responsible. But I, I don't really hear too many people, uh, Steve, from either party who, who think that those folks who have grown up basically in America should be sent back to some other country. I mean, there are a handful. Um, but it, it does seem like the fate of those who were brought here illegally, most legislators seem to want them to be allowed to stay here somehow. Well, I agree, and I think there is consensus on that point. And by the way, the president showed great compassion uh, in extending for six months and, and telling Congress, let's do this the right way, not the way President Obama did it. Uh, he pretended he was a king, and he waved his scepter and did it by executive edict. That's not the way our process works, not how our Constitution works. Uh, immigration laws have to be changed by the Congress and signed by the president. I'm confident that these people are going to be protected. I think they should be protected. But at the same time, we have to protect the national security and economic security of the United States. And our immigration immigration system is not doing that right now. The majority of immigrant-headed households in the United States are receiving some form of welfare. Uh, that's a tragedy. It's a policy misstep. It's not the reality that our parents and grandparents faced when they came here as immigrants, wanting nothing but an opportunity. So we've got to fix it. I love immigration. Has to be legal. And let's be smarter about it and move to merit-based. Well, Steve, Steve Cortez, Michael Starr Hopkins, thank you. we have to leave it there. Thank you both. Take care. Thank you. So the House just passed FISA reauthorization despite the president's tweet this morning criticizing the controversial program. Uh, meantime, Ohio Congressman Jim Jordan, he just got out of voting and he will join us live next. <laughs> Sandra wants to know what I had for breakfast. Coming up on Outnumbered, no collusion. The president repeated that again and again and suggesting there's no need for special counsel Robert Mueller to interview him since he has not shown any collusion. Is the president right or should he talk with the special investigator? Plus, special lawmakers investigator. are pressing the question, did the Obama administration use that largely unverified anti-Trump dossier, dossier to justify surveillance of the Trump campaign? Our uh, guest in the middle today, outnumbered, tells us we're asking the wrong question about that. I'll ask him what the right question is, top of the hour. So, uh, what'd you have? Oh, for breakfast? <laughs> I had sweet potato pancakes. Oh my God. Hmm. <laughs> Well, the House just voting to reauthorize the controversial FISA Act, which stands for Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. It allows, essentially, uh, government surveillance on Americans without a warrant if they are communicating with foreigners overseas. Joining me now, Ohio Congressman Jim Jordan. Uh, great to see you. Thank you so much for coming out. I know it's been a busy one. You yep. just voted. How did you vote? Oh, I voted against reauthorizing it because of what you just described. The idea that you can actually look at Americans' content and material without a warrant is not how the Fourth Amendment is supposed to operate. You're, if you're going to query anything, if you're going to search anything, you're supposed to get a probable cause warrant. That's why I wish the Amash Amendment would have passed. Uh, it didn't, and therefore uh, I was one of those members who voted against the final bill. Now, one of the amendments that, that you just mentioned that didn't pass was basically to vote on uh, whether a Officials at the NSA or the FBI should be banned from searching for or reading private messages yeah. of Americans without a warrant, uh, something the government swept up under the 702 program. For those who, who voted against or voted down that amendment, what is the reasoning? Well, I, I think you, you raise the right question. You got to view this in context. Think about what we have witnessed from this government in the last several years. First, we saw the IRS systematically target people for their political beliefs. And now we have top people at the FBI. All the evidence points to the fact that they took a dossier, a Democrat finance, Clinton campaign finance dossier, dressed it up like legitimate intelligence, took it to the FISA court to get warrants to spy on Americans, and then names that were caught up in all that, those names were unmasked. In that context, it seems to me the least we could do was require the, the Amash Amendment to go on the bill, which would say you got to get a warrant before right. you look at any Americans' data or content. All right. Congressman Jordan, thank you very much. We have to you go with breaking news, but thank you so much for taking time. So the House has voted on the uh, controversial FISA Act, as Julie was just discussing uh, with uh, Congressman Jordan. Uh, it has been approved. Uh, how? Let's listen now to uh, the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan. They're announcing plans to hire more workers and expand their operations. All of this has happened in just 20 days. So think about this. This is all before families have even started to see the benefits of lower tax rates, better withholding, and a higher standard deduction. Remember, the typical family of four making $73,000, will get a $2,059 tax cut just this year. 
So this is just getting started. And we look forward to more good news for middle-income families and for our entire economy. Um, I'd like to turn to a, a very serious issue. As you know, we are working to secure the funding to, that is needed to rebuild our military. What does that mean? Um, why do we spend so much time on rebuilding our military? Why do we spend so much time talking about this? There are countless facts and figures that I could quote about the weakening of our military capabilities. Let me just say a few things. Less than half of the Navy's planes can fly. Less than 10% of our Army's combat brigade teams are ready to fight. Our Air Force is the smallest that it has ever been. Chairman Mac Thornberry puts it best when he says, we have too few planes that can fly, too few ships that can sail, and too few soldiers who can deploy. But this is not just costing us military might. This is not just hampering our mission. This is actually costing us American lives. Last year, this nation lost 17 sailors aboard the USS John McCain and the USS Fitzgerald. Ready and ashore falls were serious factors in these fatal accidents, which happened on aging ships with expired training certifications. Every day that goes by without adequate funding is another day we are pushing our military past the breaking point. And it is a shameful situation. And we have a duty to address it and do right by the men and women who put their lives in the line to protect us here and abroad. And that is exactly what we are going to do. Questions? Chad. Happy New Year. Yeah, I guess this is my first one in it. Yeah. So since you're, since you're talking about uh, funding for the military here, Mac Thornberry indicated to me last night that he thought it would be impossible to pass another entrance <coughs> spending uh, without an agreement that we going forward on caps, particularly the military. Two-part question. Look like we're going to have to do an interim spending bill by next Friday? I, I, I can't speak to you. Well, if there's going to be another, we are making good progress on CAPS negotiations. We're working with our counterparts on getting a CAP agreement. But the appropriators will need time uh, to be able to write an actual omnibus appropriations once a CAP agreement is met. But that's what Mac is talking about, which is need to get an agreement so we can give the, the appropriators time to write their bill. And we're making good progress on CAP negotiations. When we have more progress to report, I'll let you know. Second 